Hey everybody, welcome to volume two of In Constant Motion. And uh, this disc is going to concentrate on all of my activities over the past several years outside of Dream Theater. And um, since, uh, since my last DVD, Liquid Drum Theater, I've, I've done a lot of outside work and it's been a, a great uh, growing process for me as a musician and as a, an artist and it's given me the opportunity to work with so many other great musicians out there and um, basically uh, this this disc is going to cover so much ground uh, everything from my side projects uh, I've done two albums and tours with Transatlantic I've done two albums with uh, OSI I've done a lot of session work uh, four albums with Neil Morse uh, an album with John Arch, uh, some touring with John Petrucci on the G3 tour. I've done some um, live fill-in gigs with Overkill and Fate's Warning. I've put together four tribute bands, a Beatles tribute, a Zeppelin tribute, a Who tribute, and a Rush tribute. And there's going to be footage from each and every one of these projects on this DVD, uh, basically just covering a wide range of styles and personnel. And uh, I often get asked, if, if all of the side project work that I do, if, if, it's a, if it takes away from Dream Theater or if it's a distraction. And I honestly think that it's, it's, it's been a, a really positive thing for Dream Theater. Not only myself, but the other guys in, the, in Dream Theater also do uh, side work. For me, um, it's been a great experience to be able to uh, try different styles that I can't necessarily do in Dream Theater, and I think it's it's a healthy thing to play with other musicians. Uh, Dream Theater now is is beyond 20 years of existence, and if 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 I was confined to only playing with the guys in Dream Theater, it would it would be very restrictive uh, for me to grow as an artist and a drummer. And uh, it also has probably enabled the band to last this long uh, because we don't feel the restrictions of only working with each other. I know a lot of bands. Uh, if they're confined to that one, you know, that one marriage for their entire career, sometimes that's an, an unhealthy thing and sometimes has uh, led to uh, band members leaving or the band breaking up. And I think all of the side work I've done has strengthened the bond that we have in Dream Theater. At the end of the day, Dream Theater is my baby. It's, it's, it's the home base for all of us. Uh, but it's been a great experience to go out and play with other people. For me as a drummer and a musician, I love communicating with other people and learning from other people and other musicians. And uh, the range of, of artists that I've collaborated on with these projects that are on this DVD has totally inspired me and taken me to new levels. Uh, what I do with OSI is, is one style. What I've done as a session guy for somebody like Neil Morse is enabled me to play a whole other way. The tributes I've done has enabled me to kind of get in the skin of, of some of my drum heroes and kind of learn, you know, how they ticked. And it's all been an incredibly positive thing for me on every level. So we got a lot of ground to cover. Without any further ado, let's dip into uh, all of these projects and uh, there's so much good music uh, to share with you guys. So let's jump in and start looking at it.
Transatlantic was my first uh, post-LTE project. Um, after uh, Liquid Tension Experiment did two albums, uh, which was well documented in my Liquid Drum Theater DVD, but after we had done two albums together, uh, Jordan Rudis ended up joining Dream Theater, and at that point, it felt to me unnecessary to continue with that project because we were now incorporating that writing chemistry into Dream Theater. So as a reaction to uh, wanting to have some kind of project, uh, I assembled Transatlantic. And uh, it began as uh, a longing for me to work with Neil Morse because uh, I was a big, big fan of his with the work he was doing at the time with Spock's beard. And uh, he and I had become very good friends and often talked about doing something together. So uh, Neil and I got together for Transatlantic and uh, we were joined by Pete Truavis, great, great bass player from Marillion, and Royna Stolt from uh, the band The Flower Kings out in Sweden. And uh, Royna was, was perfect because uh, like Neil, he's an incredibly prolific writer the leader of his band, multi-instrumentalist. For me, the Transatlantic Project was, a, was an opportunity for kind of uh, the masterminds be behind a lot of today's modern progressive rock bands and kind of do the, this kind of prog rock project that was going to focus on the styles of traditional classic prog rock in the veins of like Yes, Genesis, Pink Floyd, um, but also with a heavy kind of pop classic rock influence as well because uh, we all loved the Beatles and we ended up doing Beatles covers in Transatlantic and uh, we wanted to incorporate some of that with the, the four vocals as well because all four of us were singing in this project and uh, for me it was a really really exciting and rewarding experience. We, we did two studio albums, we did uh, two tours, one for each album, uh, one in America and one in Europe and uh, as a result, we have live albums and DVDs from each of those tours as well. Um, but the music we made together was something I'm really, really proud of. It was a great, great chemistry between the four of us. And I think we wrote some music that really uh, did justice to the, the prog rock genre. After those two albums and tours, Neil decided he wanted to uh, pursue his, um, his spiritual um, direction and left Spock's beard and as a result uh, wanted to stop working with Transatlantic as well. And I wouldn't have possibly um, considered con uh, continuing Transatlantic without him. So after those two albums and tours, uh, that was the end of Transatlantic. Whether or not we ever work together in the future, I am always up for it at any time. So it's really in the hands of God right now. And, uh, but uh, in the meantime, we have two albums of, of great stuff to always uh, listen to. And now I'm going to uh, dive into some of those tracks to play for you.
Okay, well, look at this beautiful kit in front of me. This is a, uh, a Tama Mirage kit. It's their new line, and uh, it's an absolutely beautiful kit. And this configuration, this is a what I call a medium kit um, that you'll be seeing on, in this DVD. And uh, basically, this, this is the setup I used uh, on the second Transatlantic album and the, the second Transatlantic tour, as well as Neil Morse's albums and his tour. And it's, it's a really uh, kind of basic kit, uh, kind of really, I could do almost anything on this kit. Uh, you know, double pedal, a bunch of toms, floor toms. I have my two signature snares. I have a, a 14 and a 12 Melody Master. I've got a, a, a good range of cymbals. Uh, I got all three of my signature splashes. I've got two of my signature stacks. Uh, it's a good range of, of stuff that I could play progressive stuff. Uh, and groove-oriented stuff, and just really get around. And uh, I, I used to do a lot of clinics on this setup as well, so it's a, a comfortable setup for me. In any case, I'm going to uh, play through some of the transatlantic tracks now. Um, I'm going to kind of show you the two different sides of transatlantic. Uh, you know, there was... The main side of Transatlantic was the progressive, long epics, and the other side was the kind of more straight-ahead, kind of poppy Beatles influence. Uh, but the first song I'm going to play is actually from the second Transatlantic album, Bridge Across Forever. And this is the opening track on the album, Duel with the Devil. And it's a, a 30 minute song, uh, roughly 30 minute. So I'm actually just going to play a portion of it, the first, you know, six or seven minutes. And uh, Transatlantic wrote some, some real epics. Um, we had uh, uh, two 30-minute songs on, on the second album, and the first album had a 30-minute song. And when we did the, the European tour, we were playing a two-and-a-half-hour show and only playing six songs, four of which were a half-hour long. So uh, really, uh, those songs are, are truly epic. Uh, so I'm going to play a bit of Duel with the Devil, the first kind of portion of it, and uh, give you a taste of what Transatlantic was all about.
woke up screaming in the silence of the night you wish you could start dreaming in clouds of white but everything could change tonight when you do with the devil living in your mind time reveals nothing it's a suicide love affair whispers in the darkness and revolution Devil living in your mind Motherless children Wandering nowhere Feels like there's miles to go Reaching for water Longing to go there Flooding into your soul Into your soul A lot of transatlantic's music is very thematic. In fact, uh, most progressive music is very thematic. And uh, one of the things when writing and arranging this music, um, it's important to kind of try to constantly develop a part in many, many di different ways. And that's something that I'm always trying to do, not only behind the drums, but as you know, a, a co-writer and arranger of a, of, of music with with the different bands that i work with and in the case of uh duel with the devil it starts off with um a theme that's kind of going through a lot of different transitions a lot of different shapes and it's taking a main theme and basically when we were writing the song uh we just tried doing that theme many many different ways and there's times where maybe the keyboards are carrying that theme or uh, the bass is carrying it and um for me i'm constantly trying to you know key in on different parts and different instrumentations and uh sometimes you know I'll, the drums will carry a part uh sometimes i'll just be following a part and uh but it's always important to listen to what the other people are playing when we're writing a song there's so many ways i can apply myself and um one of the the most important things when collaborating with other musicians is to listen to them and what they're doing and i spend most of my time in the studio whether it be transatlantic or dream theater or anybody uh listening to everything that's around me you know I spend a small portion of my time concentrating on the drums and I spend a big portion of my time thinking about the big picture and what everybody else is doing and how they interact and interlock and how I could kind of complement that. And, and it goes down to the production as well, the way things are recorded, the way that they're panned. All of those sort of things are, are really important to the big picture. And uh, this this song, Duel with the Devil by Transatlantic, is, is a good example of how there's a lot of different things going on and uh, and how, you know, the drums play a part in, in the instrumentation and the orchestration. OK, 
Okay, so now I'm going to play a track off of the first Transatlantic album. And uh, this is kind of the other side of the coin that I was talking about. This is the more Beatles kind of influence, kind of straight ahead groove, kind of poppy thing, big vocals. Um, so it's a song called Mystery Train. And uh, we really, as much as the prog thing was a big, big part of Transatlantic, the, the Beatles poppy side was also a, a really cool thing to tap into. Uh, all four of us singing and sharing lead vocals and trading off and harmonizing was was a lot of fun. And we even covered some Beatles stuff on tour. And um, not only this song, but Sweet Charlotte Pike from the second album really tapped into that as well. So I'm going to uh, play that for you now, give you a little taste of that side of the band. And uh, before I do that, I want to just quickly demonstrate uh, a groove that's going on um, in the middle of the song. It's a, a drum and bass breakdown that uh, kind of goes through a few different time signatures. So I want to break that down for you. Okay, so this middle breakdown goes through three phases. Uh, the first set is just drums and bass, and I'll start with that, and this is basically all in six. Um, so let me uh, give you a little bit of the feel that's going on in six. Now that's not a six. A lot of times six will have a swing kind of triplet feel, but this is more of a, uh, you know, more of an eighth note, sixteenth note feel, just in a literally in a, in just counting to six, like one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six. So once that beat is established, uh, after two rounds of just drums and bass, then the keyboards join in, and then we started to tag on an extra beat at the end of every fourth phrase. So it's, uh, it's still got that six feel, but uh, every fourth bar actually is a bar of seven. So it's uh, six, 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 seven. So uh, let me play that for you now and I'll uh, I'll do the accents on on the splash so you can kind of feel the time signature Okay, after the two rounds of all sixes and then the two rounds of six, 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 seven, then I uh, developed the, the drum pattern to a, a kind of funky uh, ride and hi-hat thing that's actually six, 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 uh, and then an eight at the end. So it's actually uh, setting up the feel for the bridge. And uh, let me, it's, it's a, a very cool pattern that's going on there. Uh, and when it's going fast, it's hard to really catch the nuances of the ghost notes that are being uh, done between the snare and the hi-hat. So I'm going to play that pattern for you at its normal tempo and then slow it down for you so you can really hear what's going on. Okay, so now here's that groove slowed down so you could really see what's going on here. And even slower still. So there you have it, a few different grooves that are going on in this song, and uh, so let's dig into it and all aboard. <laughs>
After Transatlantic, um, stopped working together because Neil decided to, to go into a more spiritual direction. Um, I was really happy and honored when he called me to uh, join him and play on his solo album, his first solo album. And, and uh, since then, we've gone on to do uh, three albums together, and I'm about to do a fourth with him at the time of this filming. So, uh, I, you know, I was really honored that he wanted to continue working with me. I, I feel, uh, uh, other than the relationship I have with the Dream Theater guys, I feel, um, other than that, Neil and I have uh, the best musical relationship I've ever had with any other musician. And uh, he's somebody I admire deeply. Um, first and foremost, as a musician and a songwriter, I mean, I am a fan, first and foremost. I've, I've loved, uh, you know, all of the music he's written, him as a musician, as a writer, as a singer. Um, I really admire what he does, and I'm honored to be a part of what he does um, with his solo work. But I also really, really admire him as a, as a person. He, um, he's a great friend, and uh, his, his spiritual and religious beliefs that he's been now following the path of for many years, I, I have a, a great amount of respect for that. And, uh, and I've really, I've learned a lot from uh, being a part of these albums with him. And uh, we also, in addition to the albums that we've done together, we did a, a tour in 2003 off of his uh, first solo album. Well, it's actually his third solo album. He did two well in Spock's Beard, but this was his first post Spock's Beard solo album, the Testimony album. Anyway, we did a, a, a European tour and also two shows in America. And uh, it was really one of the best musical live experiences of my career. Uh, it was a great, great band uh, with seven, eight, nine guys. I can't remember offhand, but it was a, a big band with lots of different instrumentation. And, uh, and the music, once again, his music is just, I, I put him up there with some of my favorite songwriters. You know, he's up, in my book, he's up there with John Lennon and Roger Waters and Pete Townsend. Um, I really love his work that much. And uh, it's been an honor to work with him.
reality There's a light that we can see Lighting up the pathway before us There's so much that we can know There's a godly way to go Can't you feel he's reaching out for us Here's the third best place to be He's the truth that makes you think Can't you feel he's keeping his us? This is principalities, legals and legalities They have no more power before us There's a light that we can see There's a new reality Can't you feel he's keeping his us now? So playing Neil's music has given me the opportunity to do lots of different things. Um, a good portion of his solo music is very progressive with a lot of odd times and changes. But there's also a, another side to his music, which is very, very straight ahead, power ballad, uh, just kind of very, very simple, slow and mellow and dynamic playing. And uh, that's been a, a fun change of pace for me. I've been able to do a lot of very different very tasty drumming with, with his solo work. However, for purposes of this DVD, we don't want to see slow power ballad stuff, so I am going to uh, play some, some of the music that is on his more progressive side. And the progressive side of his solo work is very, very similar to the transatlantic stuff. Uh, obviously, it's coming from him, so uh, you know that is his style. And um, a lot of it is really that traditional kind of prog sound that I played with Transatlantic as well. So the song I'm going to play for you now is off of the uh, second album we did together, which was the album called One. And this is a song called Author of Confusion, which um, it does have all those prog elements, but it, ha it's a, it has a very heavy element as well. Uh, the, the start of the song is almost like a, a punk feel, you know, kind of the Ramones, and then it goes into like a, a gentle giant kind of acapella weird vocal thing and then it's got like kind of a mellow atmospheric middle section and all the while it has prog elements so this is a, a good example of the different areas that that uh me and neil explore on his music and uh i'm, I'm gonna play the track for you but before i do that i want to quickly uh break down a couple of quick fills as well as uh the odd time phrasing of the of the first verse let me start with the fills. Um, the the very f uh, the beginning of this song, after it gets through the punk section, it it goes into this kind of big 
town, big sludgy kind of groove thing. And within this sludgy groove, and, and it's by the way, it's very hard to play a slow tempo. It's something that's always very tricky in the studio. But anyway, I'm playing this big slow um, kind of sludgy feel, and I put in a couple of these fills like uh, going around the kit. So I'm going to break them down for you right now. There's two in particular that are uh, kind of, you know, a kind of a triplet feel going around. One is us utilizing the kick drums and one is just with the hands. So I'll start with the kick drum fill. So it's kind of a, a quarter note triplet phrasing like a ba 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 boom da da ba uh 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 And I'm phrasing it uh, doing quadruplets between the, the hands and the feet. So I'm going one, two, three, four. Uh, one, two, three, four. And I'm phrasing it in quarter note triplet feel, going from snare, tom, tom, snare, tom, tom. So if I was to play the fill, just in, in simplest form, it would be this. But now, uh, to take it to the next step, I'm actually doubling the phrasing with the hands, going. And now to complete the phrase, I'm actually adding in the kick drums underneath, uh, you know, afterwards and underneath what's going on with the hands. So I'll play it quick, normal tempo, and then slow it down. So that's the, the first fill that has that feel. The second one is kind of the very the same exact concept, but actually it's a, a quick hand thing playing it instead of utilizing the feet. So let me play that for you now. So here's the hand one, extra slow. Here's the hand and foot one, extra slow. The next thing I want to quickly break down is the odd time signature uh, phrasing of the verses. Uh, Neil is doing a whole a cappella vocal thing. There's actually five different voices that eventually all come together and go on, and it, it, it's really a, a cool thing. But the, the, what makes it even more confusing than the five voices all, play, all singing different rhythms is that it's all in an odd time signature as well. So let me quickly explain the time signature and then show you the groove that I played to go with it. The time signatures are seven, three, three, six, six. So let me show you the, the groove that's going on with that. And you could kind of feel that they all feel different. The seven has a feel like. The threes are phrased like. One, two, three, one, two, three. And then the sixes are more of kind of like a halftime feel like. So once again, you put them together and you get.
Okay, so that's a few different fills and a few different phrasings that are a part of this song. So now I'm going to play the whole song for you. And uh, this song ends with a, a big, massive explosion of drum fills. And, um, you know, when I do these kind of things, I just go for it. So when, when we recorded this in the studio years ago, I just kind of improvised a few different takes. And then, you know, we just used wh whichever one I liked uh, on the album. So there's no way that I could possibly remember what I did then because it was off the cuff. So I'm just going to basically do it again off the cuff and improvise here. And uh, when I'm doing this sort of thing, uh, you know, I have the track going in my ears and I'm really concentrating. Uh, you know, you kind of have to split yourself in two. You have to be listening to what's being played by the other guys or what's being played on tape when you're in the studio. And the other half of you has to kind of be playing, uh, you know, concentrating on what you're doing and your four limbs and what they're doing. So uh, it's a it's a it's a strange thing to do. Uh, and at all times, I'm I'm always listening. I'm always kind of listening for the main accents that are being played by the guys. And you know, sometimes I'll go out across the bar line and just sometimes get way out there. But all the while, kind of still listening in the back of my head, you know, with what's going on in my ears and trying to still come down and catch those accents. Um, I don't have a a way of putting it in words of, of how I do it. I just kind of feel it and I kind of just explode. And, uh, you know, it doesn't always work, but sometimes, uh, you know, that's where you come up with those magical moments that you could never possibly plan out or, or write. So, uh, so let's see what happens. Uh, you know, here's uh, author of confusion with a big giant uh, drum explosion at the end and we'll see what happens.
inside my mind and I want to run But where can I hide off the rough confusion? Your aim is to confound till I do not know Which is up or down off the rough confusion You play inside my mind and I want to run But where can I hide off the rough confusion? You start an endless chase of all stars running round Never find their place off the rough confusion Your aim is to confound till I do not know Which is up or down low or high the truth is I don't know
next project in this uh, never-ending string of side projects I've been doing is OSI. And OSI started as a solo project of my good friend Jim Matheos. Jim and I have been friends for over 20 years, uh, he being the guitar player and writer for Fate's Warning. And uh, I've had a very long history with, with Jim and the band Fate's Warning. And uh, he and I had always wanted to work together in, in some capacity. And he was writing some material that uh, he was considering using for a solo project. And he called me to ask for some, some ideas and some input on it and maybe working together. And uh, once we started talking about it, uh, he was asking for suggestions of some musicians. And I suggested uh, Sean Malone on bass and Daniel Gildenlow, the singer from uh, Pain of Salvation. Uh, to me, I, I started immediately thinking of kind of kind of putting together a prog metal supergroup, you know, uh, much like what I had with Transatlantic and, you know, was, that was like kind of a prog rock supergroup. My wheels started spinning about doing some kind of prog metal uh, supergroup. And that, that was the, um, the origins of OSI. And, uh, and that was, you know, that, those were the musicians I had suggested to Jim. And then uh, when talking about a keyboard player, I, I suggested and asked what he thought about working with Kevin Moore, who is my old bandmate from Dream Theater. And because uh, Kevin and Jim had been working together on various things, uh, Kevin had played some stuff for Fate's Warning through the years. And uh, in any case, uh, Jim was up for it, and I was wondering how Kevin would react to it, and he ended up being up for the idea. And uh, I was very surprised and happy to hear about that. So it reunited me with, with Kev, which was a lot of fun. But uh, as soon as Kevin got involved, it kind of, the whole project kind of took on a whole different direction uh, because Kevin ended up um, writing lyrics and melodies to uh, some of these ideas. And Daniel Gildenlow was also writing some lyrics and melodies to these ideas. And it came pretty became pretty obvious pretty quickly that Daniel and Kevin weren't going to coexist in the project. Um, and basically, uh, Jim decided that, that Kevin's voice and style was more what he had in mind for the project. So long story short, that, that was the, uh, the origins of OSI. And basically, uh, me, Jim, and Kev uh, went off and made the first album at the Carriage House in um, Connecticut, and uh, basically worked off of uh, basically some riffs and, and demos that Jim had, and then Kev ended up adding lyrics and did a lot of uh, digital manipulation to some of these riffs to kind of twist them around and take them to a whole different kind of post-metal industrial landscape. So it was a very different project for me. What began as what was supposed to have been a prog metal project, it ended up once, once Kevin started really, you know, getting his identity into the music, it, it really turned more into something completely different than I had ever done and had a real industrial edge uh, with a lot of drum loops and samples and, uh, and you know, once we started playing this stuff in the studio, Kev would uh, do a lot of kind of post-production to my drums and, and chopping things up and I was really open to that just because I had never done that before. So that was the first album and uh, we, we've since made a second album but my participation in the second album was really more of a, a session guy, uh, mainly because uh, I think Jim and Kevin have a very, had a very, very strong vision of what this project was becoming. And uh, it, it was a very compromising situation for me, and I think there were just too many chefs in the kitchen. In, uh, in the, with Transatlantic and Liquid Tension, we all were very, very open and compromising with our ideas, but with OSI, Jim and Kevin really knew what they wanted and uh, th there was no room for, for me to come in and try to sway them. So uh, I kind of went on with the second album as a, more of a session guy. In any case, uh, the style of, of uh, OSI's music is a little more straight ahead. Uh, a lot of odd time signatures in some of the tracks, but for the most part, very groove oriented. And I'm very proud of the albums I've done with OSI. Uh, it's very, very different from anything else I've done in my career and uh, very, very uh, proud of to have been involved with that.
somebody put my drum kit in the dryer. <laughs> okay, here we are. Um, this is my OSI kit, and uh, this has got to be the smallest kit I've ever played. And uh, it's a lot of fun. You can really rock on this baby. This is actually, um, these are the drums that I used on both OSI albums. Um, but this is the configuration that I used on the second one, on the, the album Free. Uh, free. The CD Free, the album Free. There we go. Anyway, um, uh, my configuration for the first OSI session was uh, the same setup that I also used on the John Arch session and the 2001 G3 tour, which was basically these drums, but in the configuration of the right side of my Siamese monster setup. So all of you in the know with my kids that keep track of this stuff, you know what I'm talking about. But this is the setup I used on the second OSI album. And, um, you know, the real reason that it was, it was so small for the second session is because I had to move the stuff in myself. So, of course, I wanted to make it, make it as easy as possible. Uh, you could always tell that a person with a big drum set like me, A, has a very good drum tech, and B, doesn't have to pay for their gear. <laughs> but um, anyway, this kit is a lot of fun. It's very different. It's, a, uh, as you can see, an 18-inch kick drum. I'm using uh, the small 12-inch Melody Master. Uh, I'm using one Timbalito as a tom and just one floor tom. Uh, and although I, when I play a small drum set, if I scale down the drums, I also I still like to keep a, a big selection of cymbals. So as you can see, there's still a lot of uh, cymbals around me. And uh, basically, once again, it's a mixture of everything. This is Old Faithful. This is uh, the 22-inch HH Rock Ride, which I basically use on everything I play. And 13-inch uh, 13, uh, 13 HHX Stage Hats, a couple of Max Splashes, a Max st uh, Stacks, and uh, a couple different crashes. This is one of my favorite uh, crashes for side projects, which is the HH Extreme Crash 16-inch. In any case, that's what's going on with my kit. And um, also for you drum aficionados out there, uh, the, this finish is my original Red Monster from the Falling Into Infinity and Scenes from a Memory tour. This was the kit that I kept in Japan. And uh, after I retired this kit, I, I used it to make up this kit. And uh, this kick drum was made especially for the G3 tour and uh, the OSI and the John Arch sessions. So there you have it for you drum trivia nuts. So let's do some OSI playing. Uh, I'm going to uh, run through three tracks right now. Uh, the first two are the first and second songs from the first OSI album, which is The New Math and... Uh, OSI, from the band OSI, from the CD OSI. Thank you very much. And then the third thing I'm going to play is the title track from the second OSI album, Free. So I'm going to run through all three of these back to back. But before I do that, I want to just uh, quickly demonstrate a few different things about the new math. So this first track, the new math, is uh, probably as progressive or technical as OSI ever got. Uh, a lot of OSI stuff is ambient or just groove oriented, but uh, the new math, the opening track is definitely something that was kind of Fate's Warning Dream Theater-esque. And uh, it's all odd times. In fact, uh, the song is, is like an exercise in, in 11, because basically it's taking a few different riffs that are all in 11, and uh, my job to keep it interesting was to have my drum parts constantly changing and constantly developing. So if you were to just hear the guitar or the keyboard track, it's just this riff over and over and over and over and over and over, the same thing. Uh, it was important for me to kind of try constantly different accents to, to make it constantly build and develop. Uh, so let me break down a couple of different phrasings that I played, all in 11. And, uh, but all phrased slightly differently. So the first uh, groove I'm going to break down uh, is obviously in 11, but um, it's phrased, as most of the song kind of is phrased, in a uh, kind of 7-8 and 4-8 feel, back and forth. So it would be counted like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 1, 2, 3, 4, or... Another way of looking at is 7, 8, and 2, 4. So you can say 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 1, 2. So my phrasing for that is a very, very busy, syncopated pattern. Um, 
kind of just keeping that phrasing, but keeping it very, very busy and, and grooving right from the get-go. So let me break that down for you. I'll do it uh, at normal speed and then slow down. Now here it is slowed down. Once again, if you want to cast along, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two. Okay, the next example is uh, the next phrase that comes in the song. And uh, basically, it's 11, but uh, for this particular phrase, the guitar and the drums are playing in 11-4. So it's uh, kind of like a bar of just 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So I'm doing a pattern between the hi-hat and the uh, timbalito and then it continues with, with the same pattern done on the hi-hat and the snare. So here we go. Uh, once again, I'm, being, I'm phrasing this in 5, 4, and 6, 4. Here we go. Okay, same example, slowed down. Okay, the next level of development is going back to a quick moving um, eighth note feel. So we're back to an 11-8 groove. And uh, I'm using the same uh, phrasing that I used in the first example, which is basically a 7-8 and a 4-8 or 7-8 and 2-4 feel counted as 1, 2, 3, 4, uh, excuse me, counted as 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 1, 2. But uh, the orchestration uh, between the drums and the cymbals is a really quick kind of ride, kind of shuffle groove or whatever. So uh, let me show you that, and I'll do it fast and then slow. So as you can see, that's a really fast-moving groove um, with a lot going on, ghost notes on the snare, and uh, it's just kind of crazy. So uh, let me slow that down for you now, and you can kind of see what's going on. Okay, the final example um, is uh, subdividing my part into a whole new um, uh, phrasing that I hadn't used yet, which is basically 4-4 four, four and 3-8, or you can count it as the 4-4 four, four is equivalent to 8 eighth notes, so it could be looked at as 8-8 eight, eight and 3-8, and that's counted like 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 1. And uh, the 8-8 and the 3-8, once again, equals 11. So this is just another example of something that I love to do and just taking numbers and twisting them into different shapes and uh, coming up with different phrasings 
to, uh, you know, go underneath something that's going on with the rest of the guys. So uh, this pattern is on the china, and uh, as I said, it's phrased in 4-4 four, four, and 3-8. So here we go. Now let me slow it down for you. So that's just four of the many examples of how to play an 11. Uh, as heard in the uh, top 40 song, The New Math by OSI. Uh, and basically, as I said, it's an exercise in 11. And uh, there's many other examples throughout the song. Um, I can go on ad nauseum of all the different ways to play in 11, but why don't you just watch for yourself and basically uh, you'll watch the performance and just see how the parts are developing, different phrasings, um, and, and just always trying to keep it interesting. So the drum parts are just always trying fresh and exciting uh, parts that grow with the song and that build the tension. So uh, here we go, uh, a triple shot, if you will, of OSI. <laughs>
truth unravels. Another thing I've been doing through the years is uh, more kind of hired gun session work. And uh, it's been a fun change of pace for me because uh, obviously with Dream Theater, but also with Liquid Tension and Transatlantic, uh, those were situations where I was very, very involved with, with every aspect of it. And um, there's been some situations where I've been called upon to actually just play drums, just be the drummer. and. Uh, it's, it's a nice, refreshing change of pace to just be the drummer. And uh, obviously, I've already talked about my work with Neil Morse. In those cases, I was, you know, basically just playing his music and just, you know, being the best drummer I can for what his music called for. And there's been a bunch of situations and uh, different sessions and tours I've done through the past few years that have uh, given me that opportunity. Shortly after the OSI, the first OSI album, I did a session with Fate's Warning's original vocalist, John Arch. And John is also a, a, an old friend of mine from the old Fate's Warning days back in the mid 80s uh, when he was still in the band. I've always loved his voice. He's got one of the most unique, uh, original approach to singing and, and creating melodies. And uh, when he left Fate's Warning in the mid 80s, I, I felt it was a tremendous loss 
to the progressive metal world. And I've always been waiting for his comeback. So in 2002, what was it three, 2003, uh, when I got the call from him that he was gonna do, finally do a solo album and he wanted me to play drums on it, I was ecstatic and more than happy to, to be there for him. So uh, we did this session, it was basically a, a two song EP, but the two songs were, were very long tracks and they were written uh, by himself and Jim Matteo. So I was working with Jim again, uh, having come right, come right off the OSI uh, sessions. And Joey Vera played bass on this album and uh, I had a lot of fun. Once again, it was at the Carriage House in Connecticut. I used a really small kit for this album. It was the same kit that I had used on the first OSI album and uh, basically went in there and it, this album kind of provided me the uh, the prog metal outlet with Jim Matheos that I kind of hoped that OSI was going to be and it ended up not being. Uh, so Jim and I were actually really tapping into our prog metal uh, collaboration with, with John Arch's album. So uh, it was a lot of fun and um, some, some really cool drumming I'm proud of on that album. Another kind of hired gun situation I've uh, been a part of the last few years is working with my dream theater bandmate, John Petrucci. John was asked to do the G3 tour in 2001 while we were making the Six Degrees album, and I was really honored and uh, touched that he invited me to be a part of it with him. Uh, maybe it was uh, just uh, 
payback for me inviting him to do the Liquid Tension albums. I don't know, but in any case, or maybe he invited me so he could get out of the sessions without getting in trouble. He figured he'd bring me along to, you know, kind of uh, lighten the blow to the band. <laughs> in any case, uh, I was really, really honored that he invited me to uh, be his drummer on the G3 tour. And we did an American tour in 2001. Uh, it was John and Joe Satriani and Steve Vai. And uh, we ended up doing that tour, and then we did some shows in Mexico in 2002. And then we did a Japanese tour in 2005. And uh, we're going to be doing some South American shows uh, later on this year, which is 2006. So uh, John and I have had a, a nice little run of, uh, of G3 shows on the side. And it's been really, at first it was a, a big adjustment for me to be John's drummer and for him to write the set list and make you know, all the decisions. And at first it was strange because I'm used to the chemistry and the, the way that we work in Dream Theater, you know, where I do a lot of things and he does certain things. Uh, but I quickly you know, got used to the idea of me being his drummer for, the, for those shows. And, uh, and it was, after a while, it was fun to just be the drummer. And, uh, and those, that, those tours were amazing because it was such an amazing group of musicians on the G3 tour. I mean, obviously you have Joe Satriani and Steve Vai, but they always have great bands with, uh, you know, Virgil Donati playing drums and, and uh, you know, Billy Sheen on bass and, and Stu Hamm and, and uh, uh, Mike Keneally and Tony McAlpine. It was just this roving uh, camp of, of amazingly inspirational musicians. And it, and it, it was a, a great experience for me and John each and every time we've done it. And it's been a lot of fun. Two more situations I've been a part of the past few years was uh, uh, hired guns just for a single gig with two different bands, uh, brought in to, to do a live appearance and fill in uh, for both of these bands' um, usual drummer. And in both of these cases, it was a lot of fun, a lot of work, but a lot of fun. Uh, the first situation was um, Halloween 2004, playing with the band Overkill. Uh, they were doing a, a show a Halloween show in New York and their drummer couldn't make it and I got called in with a few days notice um, to play with them and I grew up listening to old school thrash metal you know back in the mid 80s I mean there's the obvious bands like Metallica, Megadeth, Anthrax, Slayer but I, I went deep into I was into Exodus and Testament and Overkill a lot of bands like that I mean that was a big part of my background in the mid 80s and uh, I, I had seen Overkill many times back then. In fact, I had even seen my band, uh, my wife's band play with them. Uh, Marlene was in a band called Mean Streak and I'd seen them open for Overkill back in the mid 80s. In any case, I had been following Overkill from the, the, old, the old days. And when I got called to do the gig, I, I thought it would be a, a lot of fun. It was weird for me though, because I had just finished the Train of Thought tour and I had just shaved off my beard and cut my hair thinking I was going to be home you know on vacation with the family for the next six months and I wasn't even going to be in the public eye so I could look really clean cut then I get the call to do the overkill gig and I'm completely clean cut you know playing with this metal band where I should have had the long hair and the beard and everything so I looked a little out of place <laughs> but uh, it was it was a, a tough gig we had one rehearsal um, we, we played for about two or three hours the day before the gig and uh, and it was a, a, sh a, a, a big shot of adrenaline because uh, it's the first time I, had, as much as I love that kind of music, uh, it's the first time I've actually played a full set of it where I'm just doing really fast stuff and double bass. And it was an hour straight of just full on pumping 
drumming. And uh, I have a whole, I always had a lot of respect for those kind of drummers, but I have a whole new level of respect for, for all of those drummers because, you know, to actually do that every night, whew, I was showing my age. But anyway, it was a lot of fun and uh, it was a, a fun experience. <laughs> experience I had filling in live was with my good friends Fate's Warning, who I've already talked about my relationship with Jim Matheos, uh, both with OSI and John Archer's solo album. Uh, but Fate's Warning had toured with Dream Theater several times through the years. They toured with us on the Awake Tour back in 94, 95, and then they toured with us in Queensryche in uh, 2003. Uh, so I had been very, very good friends with those guys for, for many, many, many years. And uh, I think it was inevitable that I would one day Sit, uh, sit behind the drums with them. And basically, uh, Mark Zonder had left the band and they were doing some shows with Nick Virgilio filling in. In fact, Nick was playing with them when they toured with us in 2003. But for whatever reason, Nick couldn't do this one gig and they asked me to fill in and we did this one show in, in Holland. And uh, this, was, this was a tough gig to step into because Mark Zonder's drum parts are very, very uh, technical and uh, the music in itself is very similar to Dream Theater, a lot of time signatures, and, uh, at, but Mark's playing is also really, really uh, very uh, tasteful and, and you know, something that's not easy to um, replicate. So it was that that took 
a lot of digging in for me. Uh, I had to do a lot of homework for that gig, and we had a full day's rehearsal in Holland the day before the gig. It was a full eight-hour day. But it was a lot of fun, and uh, you know, something that I would do again in a heartbeat if ever they needed the help. They're good friends and a great band, and I'm really uh, happy to have been part of their uh, history. Yo, 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 what's up? Welcome to MPTV Cribs and uh, the lifestyles of the Prague and infamous. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> uh, anyway, welcome. Uh, welcome to my humble abode. Uh, we have left the beautiful surroundings of Allaire Studios uh, to suburbia, USA, where we will uh, take a tour of my home and uh, I will show you some of the drum kits in my drum room and talk about all sorts of different things I've been up to the last couple of years. So for the remainder of this DVD, we're gonna be at Home Sweet Home, so come on in. There's a bomb right there, watch your step. <laughs> Ta-da! Ah, it's nice and air-conditioned in here. Come on in. Assorted Dream Theater plaques. This is the stuff that built this home. Thank you to the fans at home. Ah, Modern Drummer Magazine reader polls. Thank you so much, you wonderful fans at home. Modern Drummer been very, very good to me. This is it, this was my very first drum. Uh, I bought this when I was about 16, 17 years old, my first Tama kit. This was the drum kit I used in the early days of Dream Theater when we were Majesty. And uh, I keep it out here in the hallway, separate from the rest of the drum room, just as a reminder as to where, where it all began. And this is where it all began. Let's keep going. Storm Thurgerson, original drawing for Falling Into Infinity. And above it, another hand drawing that he proposed to us, which we passed on, and it ended up being Pink Floyd's Greatest Hits cover. All right, welcome to my library. And as you can see, um, I've been collecting stuff my whole life. I, I've been uh, cursed or maybe blessed with, uh, with OCD, which means basically I, uh, I'm obsessive compulsive about everything I get into. So even, even from when I was a little kid, if I got into a, a band, I had to go out and buy every record and every magazine and every book. And uh, you know that kind of behavior through my whole life has blossomed into this. And, uh, but basically, um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a music fan. I'll always be a fan of other drummers and other bands, and doesn't matter how much success or what I do with, with, with my career, it doesn't matter. I'm still always going to be that 10-year-old kid, you know, listening to, to Kiss records in my basement, and uh, I'm still like that. And I've, I've never, been, uh, never been ashamed to wear my influences on my sleeve, or on my leg in my particular case. And uh, basically, this last portion of the DVD, I want to talk a lot about influences. I'm going to um, show you uh, four different tribute bands that I've put together in the past couple of years. And uh, paying tribute to my heroes and uh, these tribute bands that I've done, as well as um, with Dream Theater, I've covered so many 
so many different songs and even full albums with Dream Theater. We've done a, a Maiden album in its entirety, a Metallica album, a Deep Purple album, a Pink Floyd album. So I've, I've done lots of different tributes inside of Dream Theater and outside of Dream Theater. We've done a lot of one-off cover songs. And uh, I, I, I love paying tribute to uh, all of the different bands and, and drummers and artists that have basically shaped me to who I am. As far as my specific drum influences, um, there's a wide range, but um, I think I've always kind of traditionally broken it down to the big four. And those are the, uh, the four that I'm going to be talking about uh, in the remainder of this DVD. And that would be Ringo, John Bonham, Keith Moon, and Neil Peart. Uh, so those, are, those were always the big four that really had a big, big part in my development as a drummer when I was younger. So we're going to look at those drummers and my tributes I've done to them. Uh, but I do want to point out that there are so many more as well. Um, you know, when I started out, uh, it was Ringo and John Bonham and Keith Moon. Those were the ones that really helped me learn how to play the drum set. But throughout that young, formative period, Nick Mason from Pink Floyd was a big one. Uh, Mitch Mitchell from Jimi Hendrix's band was a big one. I, w I went through a big kiss phase, and Peter Chris was a big, big influence on me when I was a, a, you know, a kid. Even later on, it was uh, Tommy and Marky Ramone. I was a big Ramones fan many years when I was younger. So those are a lot of the drummers that were really important for me in the, the early years. Uh, and then I discovered Neil Peart, and that opened up my, my ears to a whole new world of progressive drumming, utilizing odd time signatures. So Neil was the big one. But uh, throughout that period, I was listening to a lot of Yes. So Bill Bruford and Alan White were huge influences for me. Simon Phillips, Rod Morgenstein, and then Frank Zappa's music was a tremendous influence on me uh, for many, many years and still is to this day. So his drummers, Terry Bozio, Vinnie Cagliuta, Chad Wackerman, Chester Thompson, all of those guys were huge influences. So that, this was a period when I was a, a late teen um, going off to college and late high school uh, when I was really into more progressive music and those are the drummers that really kind of I cut my teeth on for that stuff and then I went through a period where I was listening to uh, you know more metal stuff was becoming popular in the mid 80s and and guys like Lars Ulrich and Charlie Benante and Dave Lombardo those were the drummers that towards the mid 80s uh, you know, they started to come around. I was listening to a lot of the really heavy double bass stuff, and they they kind of helped form me in that direction. Uh, so, I mean, that that's that, those are the basic periods. There was, you know, the the beginning period, the progressive period, the metal period. Those are the the drummers that really helped form my style uh, in my first, you know, ten years of drumming. Uh, since then, I, I listened to so many, so many different drummers out there. There's so many great players, and uh, I'm always inspired. No matter how many drum festivals I do or drum shows, uh, I'm always on the side of the stage watching all these other drummers. People like, like Mike Mangini and Virgil Tenati, those guys just are incredible players and completely inspire me every time I see them. Uh, so I never stop listening. It's, it's important for me to, as a drummer and a musician in order to keep growing, I got to keep listening. And I listen with an open mind. I listen to so many different styles of music. You know, I could be just as inspired by U2 and Coldplay uh, as I can be by Radiohead and Muse or Pantera and Lamb of God. You know, it's all a big, giant, melting learning pot for me. And I try to always keep an open ear. So that's my general influences. Now let's focus on, uh, as I mentioned before, the, the big four for me. And uh, let's take a look at them now. So this is where it all began for me. Uh, the Beatles uh, were my, my first love in music, and to this day, they're still my, my number one favorite band of all time. And uh, literally, from, from the moment I was born, I was introduced to them. I uh, came shooting out of my mom's womb. Immediately slapped on the headphones and Sgt. Pepper was released a few months later and, and my life was never the same since. And uh, I remember for many, many years as a little boy just always listening to those little records with the green apples on them and, you know, I, I was a, a Beatles fanatic the first few years of my life. And I, I even saw George Harrison live in 73 when I was only six years old. I saw, saw Paul McCartney in 76 when I was nine. So I had a very early appreciation for them. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, you know, 
everything before the Beatles was just, you know, it was simple one, four, five blues, rhythm and blues, soul. And when they came around, especially once they started experimenting around 66, 67, they just changed all the rules, invented all new ones. They just broke all ground. And Ringo, as their drummer, for me, was uh, my first drum hero. And uh, he was such a character, you know, in their movies and the cartoons and stuff. He was always the focal point of the, the storyline. He was always the character. And, uh, and I, I appreciated that. But once I started to really listen to, to their music and appreciate the musicality of, of their music, I started to realize how important Ringo was to that formula. And of course, John and Paul and George were the main composers, but Ringo really, um, as, as the band was breaking so many rules and, and kind of paving the whole, a whole new way for creating music, Ringo was doing the same with drumming, because all drumming before him was pretty straight ahead. And if you listen to his drumming, especially in the mid 60s, mid to late 60s, he was experimenting with, with you know, doing multiple drum tracks and overdubbing and, and having panning and percussion and tambourines and shakers and doing all kinds of really, really interesting things that no drummer had done before then. So when I was asked to do the Modern Drummer Festival in 2003, uh, they wanted me to close one of the nights and the closing, closing artist always plays with the band. So they gave me the opportunity to really bring anything I wanted to the show. And uh, I took the opportunity at that point to, to fulfill a lifelong dream, which was to play in a Beatles cover band. Uh, you know, w with what I do in Dream Theater, it's so busy and technical that most of the time I don't get to really apply my love for the Beatles in, in what I do with Dream Theater. Uh, so when Modern Drummer offered me, uh, you know, the opportunity to do anything that I could dream up, I, I, I took the opportunity to put together a, a Beatles cover band, and that was the genesis for what ended up becoming a series of tribute bands. But the, the Beatles tribute was the first one I did, and that was a band called Yellow Matter Custard. And uh, we played at the Modern Drummer Festival, and we also did a headlining show in New York. So it was two shows in May of 2003. And uh, assembling the lineup for this band, I, I wanted to choose other musicians, not only that I, that I admire, but guys that I knew were Beatles, Beatles fanatics just as I am. And the first person to immediately come to mind was my good friend Neil Morse, because me and Neil have covered Beatles stuff with Transatlantic, and, and uh, you know, whenever we're together, we're always singing Beatles tunes. And he does an amazing John Lennon impersonation, and he's able to play many different instruments as, as John and Paul and George did. So, so Neil immediately came to mind. Matt Bissonette is a bass player that I had toured with. Uh, he was in Joe Satriani's band and I had done the G3 tour with, with Joe Satriani as well as uh, Dream Theater and Joe Satriani did a tour together in 2002. So I spent a lot of time with Matt and he was another Beatles fanatic and uh, I knew he would be perfect. And it turns out that right before we did the Yellow Matter Custard gigs, he ended up getting a gig with his brother Greg playing with Ringo. So he was like in full on Beatles mode by the time we did Yellow Matter Custard. The guitar position, it was originally supposed to be Ty Tabor from King's X on guitar. And King's X toured with Dream Theater and Joe Satriani. So a lot of times when me and Matt were having Beatles talks, Ty would chime in as well because he was such a great Beatles fan. It turns out that uh, scheduling didn't allow Ty to be able to participate, so I had to look for another guitar player. And I thought of a lot of guys, but the, one of the people that came to mind was Paul Gilbert. Aside from being an absolutely amazing guitar player, I knew he had a deep appreciation for all kinds of music and, and classic bands, and I knew he was a Beatles fan. So I contacted him, and he came on board, and it ended up being uh, the beginning of a, a long relationship between me and Paul through these tribute bands. But Yellow Matter Custard was the first one, and, uh, and it, it was an amazing experience, and I absolutely loved paying tribute to this great band, and all four of us sang, gave me a chance to really play incredibly simple music, uh, sing, and really just play for the music. Finally, I want to just show you the kit that I have here. And as you can see, this is a replica of Ringo's classic early 60s kit. And Tama made this kit for me uh, specifically for the Yellow Matter Custard gigs. And as you can see, it's a, a simple four piece, you know, kick, snare, rack and floor tom, they're all small toms and, and white coated heads and the symbols were uh, AA symbols from Sabian, just basically a crash and a crash ride and a set of hi-hats. It's pretty much the smallest kit I've ever played. 
Um, and it was just so much fun to, to dig into this kit and just play it. And, and uh, anyway, now let's go to some footage. What we're going to show you right now is some uh, previously unseen footage from the Modern Drummer Festival shot by the great fellas at Hudson Music. And uh, this footage has uh, been previously unreleased, so uh, this is the first time you're going to see this right here. John Henry Bonham, a.k.a. Bonzo, probably one of the biggest influences on so many drummers today. Uh, his style basically was, was groundbreaking at its time. There were no other drummers playing with the power and the groove that he completely commanded and uh, drove Led Zeppelin to be one of the biggest bands in America throughout the 70s. And for me, as a young kid in the early 70s, Led Zeppelin was uh, one of the coolest bands around and, and John Bonham became a big influence for me very early on. His grooves are so memorable, they're so historic, they, they are rock and roll history. Uh, everything from the intro to rock and roll and when the levee breaks to uh, the shuffle groove of Fool in the Rain. His style is something that has inspired and influenced drummers for, for generations and decades now. And uh, for me, uh, when, when it came time to uh, put together another tribute band, there was no question that a John Bonham Led Zeppelin tribute was next on my list. So after the Yellow Matter Custard performance at the Modern Drummer Festival, I was asked to perform at the Montreal Drum Festival 
And uh, once again, they gave me liberty to put together anything. And, uh, and I took advantage of the opportunity to uh, put together my Zeppelin tribute, Hammer of the Gods. Joining me once again was Paul Gilbert, who is a Zeppelin fanatic as well. And uh, he dove into this gig uh, completely headfirst, nailing every one of Jimmy Page's nuances, uh, from the guitars to, to the to the playing with the with the violin bow and, and it was just a, a an amazing experience. Paul did an amazing job on that. Uh, playing bass for us was Dave LaRue from the Dixie Dregs and uh, who had also played with me in John Petrucci's band on the G3 tour and now he currently plays with Joe Satriani. And Dave I knew would be perfect for this because he's a rock solid bass player just the way that John Paul Jones was. And then joining us on vocals, this was a, a tough shoe to fill. Robert Plant is a, is a distinctive voice and with such a high range, there's very few people I could think of that could fill his shoes. And I invited uh, my good friend Daniel Gildenlow from uh, Sweden's Pain of Salvation, who's a, a bit of a more obscure name to uh, some American uh, fans out there. But uh, he's somebody who, who has such an incredible range as a vocalist and uh, and he's one of the few people I could think of that could actually cover Robert Plant's vocals. And the funny thing is, is that Daniel wasn't uh, a Led Zeppelin fan like me, Paul, and Dave were. Uh, Daniel's a little younger than us, so he grew up kind of more the generation growing up with uh, Dream Theater, you know, uh, and Metallica and Queensryche, with the way we grew up with Zeppelin and, and bands like that. So he kind of had to almost take a crash course in, in learning all these songs. They weren't embedded in his brain the way they were for me, Paul, and Dave. Anyway, um, one of the, the most fun for me uh, of, of the, these gigs was the kit itself. And as you could see, Tama made me uh, an exact replica of Bonzo's uh, Amber Vistalite kit, which he used on the song Remains the Same. And um, this kit was so much fun to play. Big, giant, 26-inch bass drum, big toms, you know, uh, Sabian actually made me uh, prototypes to match John Bonham's symbols at the time. And I have some 15 inch hats, three crashes and uh, a big giant ride. And it, the whole kit was an exact replica of John Bonham. Just everything was big and boomy and just loud and powerful. And this kit felt so great to play. And uh, after we did the two Hammer of the Gods gigs, I, I couldn't just put away this kit and let it sit in my basement. So I actually ended up bringing it in to uh, the studio with Dream Theater when we made Octavarium. And I ended up using this kit on more than half the album. And then as a result, as I talked about on the other disc, I ended up incorporating this setup into my latest Dream Theater kit. So anyway, there you have it. That's uh, John Bonham, Led Zeppelin, Hammer of the Gods, and my kit. That's the story. And now let's uh, let the music do the talking. We're going to see some footage from one of the shows. And these shows took place in November 2003. And uh, of course, the track that I have to include on this DVD is, is Moby Dick, which includes uh, the, the, the long extended John Bonham drum solo. And basically, I, I did John Bonham solo. This isn't Mike Portnoy soloing at all. This was me doing John Bonham's thing and trying to get into his headspace and trying to cop his style. And I, you know, basically with the tambourine on the hi-hat and playing with the hands and playing with the timpani, this is all John Bonham. And I'm just trying to pay tribute to the man who was just uh, one of the greatest ever to live. And here we go, Moby Dick. Mike Portnoy, Moby Dick, Dick, Dick.
favorite drummers and uh, probably my first drum hero when I was a kid and uh, he was a one-of-a-kind drummer there's never been anybody there was never anybody like him before him and there's been nobody like him since and uh, he was definitely one of a kind his style his personality and uh, somebody that I really miss I really miss uh, hearing him and seeing him he was such a, an inspiration to me and uh, I, I was introduced to the who uh, just as early as the Beatles. They were one of my favorite bands when I was a little tiny kid and uh, when Tommy came out in 1969 uh, it was my favorite album through most of my childhood. So I, I was uh, listening to The Who from the, from the very beginning of my life and uh, it wasn't until years later that I actually discovered Keith's uh, 
part of The Who and, and you know, his impact on me as a drummer. Uh, I saw the movie The Kids Are Alright uh, when it came out in 1979 and although I had been, you know, listening to Tommy and Live at Leeds and Quadrophenia, you know, for all those years, I had never really seen Keith. Uh, so when I saw him on the screen with The Kids Are Alright, I, I was blown away by his personality. He, he was just the type of drummer you couldn't take your eyes off of and he was a big, big influence on me in terms of showmanship and uh, the way he was on, just so commanding on stage, just you know, bouncing his sticks and, you know, the, the crazy faces. And he was just such a personality. He played drums like a real lead instrument. And uh, for me, um, you know, when I was around 10 or 11 years old, he was it. You know, he was my first real drum hero. And uh, I idolized him. Keith played like a total hurricane. His style was unlike any drummer I've ever seen before. He didn't ever play a solid backbeat or groove. He was actually just a whirlwind of, of tom fills and cymbal swells and his kick drums were always pulsating and, and rather than actually laying down a solid groove and foundation he was constantly just playing circles around it and I realized when I did these tribute shows how, how incredibly exhausting it is and I have no idea how he was able to sustain that type of energy and style night after night. So I knew I had to do a, a Who tribute and really tap into my, the Keith Moon inside of me. And uh, this band, I think of the four tribute bands I put together, this band had, had the most awesome lineup. Paul Gilbert, of course, on guitar, and Paul did an amazing job, as always. On bass was Billy Sheehan, and I couldn't have thought of anybody else to be playing bass in a Who tribute, because Billy is, I think, the greatest bass player alive, and John Entwistle's style was, was just such a, an upfront lead type of uh, bass playing that really Billy was just absolutely perfect. In fact, I wanted to do, to do this Who tribute years earlier and was basically waiting for Billy's availability to actually follow through and, and, and pull it together. So once he had a, a window of opportunity, we went forward and, and did the tribute. And on vocals, Gary Sharon, uh, another, I think it was, he was a perfect choice to, uh, to do the Roger Daltrey part. And, uh, Gary's a, a tremendous front man, such a great, great front man, and as Roger Daltrey was. And uh, his voice was, was incredibly similar as well to Roger. So this band came together, amazing journey. We did three shows uh, across America, one in LA, one in Chicago, one in New York. All three of them were so much fun. Uh, for me to be able to get into Keith Moon's body, I mean, I just felt completely possessed by him. Uh, just really the, all the nuances and the, and the way he played and the way he acted on stage. Uh, I, I was definitely tapped into his spirit for these shows and it was a lot of fun. My kit for the Amazing Journey shows was, uh, it was a little different from the other tributes. The other, other tributes I did, I had one kit that Tama made me and I did all the shows on that one kit. For the Who shows, uh, I knew that there was a possibility that after the first show, the drum kit would be completely destroyed. <laughs> so uh, Tama actually made me a, a kit for LA and for New York, uh, two different kits with the same configuration, which is this kit that I'm sitting behind now. And this setup is basically Keith's uh, kit from around 69 to 71. It's the kit that he used at Woodstock and, and the Isla White concert and all the Tommy performances. And to me, this was a, a very classic set up for him. Um, very, very simple. Three 14-inch rack toms, the exact same uh, depth, and three crash cymbals. No hi-hat, no ride, no china, no splashes, just three, three crashes. And uh, I've never played a kit before with no hi-hat or no ride, and, and it was a, a really bizarre setup to, uh, to adapt to. And he did use a hi-hat in the studio, uh, and also on some earlier and later kits. But on this particular kit, this was it. Three crashes, Three 14-inch toms, three floor toms, two kicks and a snare. It's a, it's a really simple and strange kit, but uh, a lot of fun to play. So this was the kit I used in New York and L.A., and uh, this kit is the one that I used at the New York show, and it's slightly beat up. You can see that uh, there's some holes in my bass drum back here from at the end of the show. I swung some cymbal stands through the kick drums, and uh, there's a nick on the bass drum somewhere where Billy Sheehan smashed his bass. But... Uh, Basically, um, it was a lot of fun playing on this kit. And uh, the Chicago show, I had a completely different kit. Um, the Chicago show was being uh, promoted by Victor Salazar and, and the guys at the drum pad. And they have a, 
a thing where uh, Victor really likes to reproduce classic kits. So uh, he, he went ahead and actually built Keith's classic 75 kit, which was, you know, multiple rows of concert toms and, you know, it was the white finish and the, the gold rims. And that was a, a, a beautiful kit that I just used for that one show in Chicago. And I went easy on it at the end of the kit, at the end of the show. I didn't destroy it too bad, just a little bit. So it was a lot of fun. Anyway, uh, enough about the kits and Keith and the music. Let's actually uh, look at some of the footage uh, from these shows. And uh, once again, Keith, I miss him. Uh, he was really one of my all-time heroes and one of a kind. And uh, there's not many people like him out there. And uh, I did my best to, uh, to um, do justice to, to his legacy for a whole new generation of people to see what an amazing character and drummer he was. So uh, here's some footage from Amazing Journey. Jeff Dom and Blind Boy, he's in a quiet vibration land. Strange as it seems, his musical dream. Ain't quite so
Neil Peart. Probably one of the most obvious of all of my influences. And um, Neil completely changed me as a drummer. Um, you know, I, I've already talked about Ringo and John Bonham and Keith Moon, and those three really got me started, and I really began learning about drums through those guys. But once, uh, once I became a, a teenager and entered high school and I started to get really serious about drumming, that's when I discovered Neil and Rush. And it completely changed the way I, I played the drums because suddenly uh, here was a player that was uh, taking it to another level technically. And once I started to really dive into Rush's music, that's when I really started to learn about odd time signatures and different phrasings and uh, more progressive arrangements. And it, it had a, a huge, huge impact on the way I, I played drums. And uh, as a result, you know, when, when, when we formed Dream Theater back in 1985, um, our biggest influences, myself, John Petrucci and John Myung, all three of our biggest influences at that point in our lives were Rush. So uh, their music and Neil in particular for me ended up uh, being a big part of the blueprint and the foundation that created Dream Theater's sound and style in years to come. So it was probably inevitable that I would end up putting together a Rush tribute band at some point. And uh, unlike the Beatles, Zeppelin, and Who tributes, in those cases those were bands that were real personal influences for me and music that I didn't necessarily get to pay tribute to or pa tap into with Dream Theater. Uh, the Rush tribute was a little different because obviously it's very close stylistically to what Dream Theater does. So Dream Theater has done many Rush covers throughout the years, everything from Passage to Bangkok to Jacob's Ladder to uh, Working Man and By Tour and the Snow Dog and 2112. I mean, we've always fiddled around with Rush covers in our sets through, year, through the years. And uh, also, I had uh, participated in a Rush tribute album back in 19, 1995. So uh, I had already paid tribute to Rush, essentially, in, in many different forms. So I, I wasn't even planning on doing a Rush tribute the way that I you know, had in mind the Zeppelin, Beatles, and Who ones, because I already felt like I had done that. But the opportunity came about, the drum pad, uh, which is a, a great, great drum shop in, in uh, Palatine, Illinois. They were celebrating their 20th anniversary, and they invited me to participate. And uh, for some reason or another, we talked about different options, and the idea of doing a Rush tribute at this drum pad show came up. And uh, it seemed it seemed like it was a perfect time to do it, and it would, I knew it would be a lot of fun to do, and I would be able to play a few more of the obscure, longer, kind of cult classic tracks that uh, I hadn't been able to do with, with Dream Theater or with the Tribute album. And so Cygnus and the Sea Monsters was born, and uh, for this Rush tribute, I once again had my, my trusty partner in crime for these tributes, Mr. Paul Gilbert, who's just so well-rounded and diverse that he could play anything. So of course uh, he joined me. On bass was Mr. Sean Malone. Sean's a good friend of mine for many years now, an amazing bass player um, who played with me on the first OSI album and he used to be in a band called Cynic which was kind of the very first jazz death metal pioneers. You know, he, he plays a fretless bass and he's just a, an amazing player that could play jazz and metal and prog. Uh, so he was an obvious choice to me for this and he's a big Rush fan as well. And on vocals is uh, Jason McMaster, and Jason uh, used to be in a band called Watchtower, and Watchtower one of the, were one of the very first bands I had ever heard to play super, super technical, progressive music with a heavy edge, and a very obvious Rush influence on those guys, but more like Rush on steroids. So Jason was, is one of the few singers I could think of that could sing in the stratosphere like Getty's old vocals from the 70s, you know, very, very high screaming and... Uh, very few guys I could think of that could actually do that without ripping their throats open. So Jason was perfect, so uh, he was on board and, and there was the band. Um, one of the most amazing things about this gig, and it was only one gig, it was in uh, September of 2005, and unlike the other tributes, this was just one show that was part of a festival. So uh, it was very few people got to actually be there and witness this thing, because it really wasn't open to the public beyond the drum pad show. And uh, anyway, the most amazing thing about this gig was 
this drum kit. And Victor Salazar at the drum pad uh, is an amazing guy in terms of, uh, you know, uh, promoting clinics and stuff like that for the drum pad. And, and in all cases, he always tries to reproduce the kits. Uh, and uh, I did a, a, a drum clinic back there in, in 2002 or so, and, and he reproduced uh, the entire Siamese monster uh, that I play with Dream Theater. And, and uh, basically, you know, he, when we decided to do this Rush tribute, he knew he had to reproduce the, the classic Tama uh, Signals era Neil Peart kit, which was uh, this candy apple red finish. And this basically is the kit that when I became a Rush fanatic, I really discovered Rush around 81, 82. And the first time I saw Rush live was in December of 82, and this was the kit that Neil was playing. And that period for me, I was at my most fanatical about Rush. If you look at my high school yearbook, it says future plans, for, for, and it says to become the next Neil Peart. Uh, you know, he was my hero, and, and uh, this was the kit that he was playing during that period when I was just idolizing him. And uh, this was the one that, that I saw on the Signals tour, and this was the kit that I would stare at and dream about playing, and, and now the drum pad anniversary came around, and Tama and Sabian and everybody came on board to build this this master ship for me here. And uh, basically it's, it's his, his classic 83 kit with uh, the concert toms and uh, all of the gadgets, all the symbols of the Paragon, uh, Neil Peart signature symbols. And uh, it was a, a dream come true to play this kit, but a big challenge as well. All the other tributes I did, I was, it was more simple. I was able to actually just sit behind the kits and play you know, music that I grew up with my whole life. Uh, with this Rush tribute, it was a big challenge to learn this music and an even bigger challenge to get comfortable on this kit. Uh, it, it was, it's, you know, he, sit, he sits very high, at least on this kit, and the toms are out, and uh, it was a big challenge, and we only had one day's rehearsal to learn it all, but it was a lot of fun. Enough talking. Let's dig into it. Um, the, the track that we're going to show you here is, uh, of course, YYZ with the drum solo, and uh, as I did with the John Bonham drum solo, uh, when I did this solo, it was as faithful as possible to Neil's original YYZ solo from Exit Stage Left. And basically, um, you know, I tried to get into his, into his head and his body and try to basically do his solo in his style. So it's not really so much me as, as much as it is me paying tribute to him. So here we go from Chicago, the drum pad 20th anniversary show, YYZ and the drum solo.
You guys are still here? Whew, you're real gluttons for punishment. Wow, even I couldn't make it through the whole thing. And it's on my favorite subject, me. <laughs> anyway, thanks for sticking around and checking out my new DVD. And uh, hopefully you found it informative, uh, possibly educational, uh, but hopefully most above all, uh, entertaining. And to me, that's what, what I've been doing for the last few years. It's all about, it's about uh, entertainment and uh, you know, working with different musicians and. And that's been the focus for me, uh, you know, not so much practicing drums by myself and doing clinics and doing solos and, you know, that's great. It's great to be in, in, your, in your drum room at home practicing your chops and technique, but uh, at the end of the day it's all about how it's applied in a musical setting with others and playing with other musicians. And that's been the focus for me the last couple of years is just trying to create many different musical environments to work in. And uh, for me it's, it's not about being a soloist and an individual, it's more about being part of a, a group effort and, a, and a, you know, the sum being greater than all of its parts. So anyway, hopefully you enjoyed this look back on this DVD and uh, for me it's been a lot of fun traveling through time and looking at the projects I've done the last couple of years and uh, thanks for taking that trip with me and uh, I'm going to go back to sleep now, okay? So take care. See ya. Oh, yeah. <laughs> It's been a very, very cool day. Thank you very much. Oh, you're still here? My God, you got a, a large, uh, big tolerance. <laughs> Playing boring old drums. That's it, I quit. <laughs> Not enough. <laughs>